when I was a kid, I was one of the best at crab fishing in southern Norway. In only one day, I caught 518 crabs with my bare hands. I let them out again, of course. The crabs were my friends. They taught me about the wonderful world that exists in the sea. But now, things are quite different. I'm living by the Oslo Fjord, and it's almost dead. There are significantly less marine species for my daughter to become friends with. This is a huge problem. Coastal ecosystems are among the most modified and threatened globally. Plastic and pollution are familiar reasons for this, and changes are made to cope with these. But as the human population living in coastal areas increases, we have to talk about how urban planning and development can reduce their impact on marine ecosystems. Because as we build and extend cities, we harden the shoreline with concrete structures and destroy the habitats of marine species. So how do we take better care of these species when we build and plan our cities? Well, first of all, by noticing that they are there. I'm an urban researcher, and I work with this idea called planetary urbanization. It means that when urban phenomena are analyzed, it must be kept in mind that these are always linked to what we think of as not urban. So the countryside, the sea, animals and other species. Of course, it's not an obvious leap to make, to think of the sea when you think about what makes a city. The sea is mostly invisible and unreachable to us, and so we often treat it as a void. For example, when I moved to Oslo, I wanted to live by the fjord, and I was looking at these glossy architectural images of the latest, greatest harbor front development. The sea was portrayed as a shiny, shimmering surface, a beautiful view to look out across. But then I realized, these images portrayed the sea as if there was nothing relevant beneath the ocean's surface. And I knew that hidden beneath that shiny cover, you'll often find highly disturbed, even devastated seascapes. If this view of the Oslo Fjord was visible to us, or even better, if crabs and starfish and mussels could participate in urban planning, I think we would have treated this place quite differently. But that's ridiculous, right? Of course, other species cannot participate. I mean, they literally don't have a voice. And the thing with urban planning is that in order to participate, you have to be a rational speaking human being. So when the architects in charge of the harbour front development decided to build a park by the fjord, they obviously just asked us humans for our opinion. They organised a public consultation so that we could have a say about what we wanted from the park. And we agreed that the park was important for human needs such as health, well-being, recreation, even beauty. But what about the needs of the other species? There's seldom mention of how the relation might go the other way around, how a new development might be an important source of the health and well-being of other species already occupying the site. Most often, they're completely left out of the conversation. So I set about to find out how we can include them in the conversation too. And I thought about the many years I've spent trying to include marginalized human voices in urban planning. And through this work, I learned that barriers to participate, it's not located in the capacity of individuals. It's about those leading the conversation, about whether they let others in. So the question isn't enough, it's not about whether or not other species can speak. The question is, how can we change the conversation to enable other species to have a say, regardless of their capacity to speak? In one way, this is already happening in urban planning through the idea of a spokesperson. So that is through people who are elected or engaged to speak on behalf of others. And there are spokespersons for nature. 
These are experts, for example, environmental scientists, who argue for the preservation of nature based on facts and figures. And this kind of advocacy is important, but it's often accompanied with doubt. Does this person really represent nature? Or are there other interests at stake in these facts and figures too? I was interested in a different kind of spokesperson. One that we can all become. One that is not about establishing facts, but about establishing relations. That is, I want to find out whether becoming a spokesperson could move beyond simply representing someone towards actually letting this someone make a difference in how we think about and relate to them. So, with my colleague Elin Sørensen, I staged an experiment where I invited a group of people to become such spokespersons. And this was a diverse group of people, from children to elderly of all kinds of occupations. They were invited to a public consultation about the park proposal. The consultation included the same questions that the architects used in their consultation, only in our version, we asked these questions to the other species. So imagine, you are now all spokespersons of different species. Crab, swan, tree, rock. And I asked you to discuss the following questions. What should this park be used for? What needs should it fulfill? What user groups should be prioritized? So to facilitate this discussion, the consultation was organized as a form of role play and the group took part in pairs. One person was the spokesperson and the other one just listened in but they can swap places whenever they wanted. So the spokesperson was both inside the role, speaking from the perspective of the other species, and outside the role, listening to what it was saying. And this was important, because the aim was not to spend the time trying to become this other species. Of course, we can never become, say, a crab, or even know what a crab might be thinking. But we can try to imagine the world from the crab's perspective, and this way, enable a relation of respect across the difference between us. And this is what solidarity is all about. To be able to have empathy with someone that is not like you. Only today, solidarity is mostly about sameness, when a crisis hits, it's easier to have solidarity if the victim is like us, or even part of our community. So in order to take better care of nature, some argue that we have to re remove the hierarchy between us, so that humans and swans and crabs and insects, they were all the same. Problem is, we are not really the same. Other species are not equal to us in terms of, for example, political and legal abilities. I mean, they're not even aware of our political system. I think that the problem with this focus on sameness is that we lose the ability to identify with someone that is different from us. And we ignore the power we humans have over, over, other, over other species. This has proven detrimental to our planet. We care mainly about our own species. We grow up to think that we were born to rule the world, not realizing that caring only for humans leads to the neglect or even active eradication of other species. We don't know exactly how many species exist in the world, but say there are around 100 million species. 10,000 of these are getting extinct every year. And of course, some living beings we do want to get rid of, like corona. But that's the point. We have to get better at take responsibility for the exclusions that are inevitably made when we try to make a better urban future. We have to think through the possible wider consequences of excluding marine species when we decide to harden the shoreline with concrete structures. One of the architects that took part in my experiment said that it made him realize that he was caught in a transformation paradox. 
As an architect, he had an urge to transform the world, to make it better. For example, by filling the shoreline with beaches and pavilions and benches for human well-being. But this urge to transform, he realized, is at the same time the root cause of the environmental crisis, the overuse and destruction of natural resources. What if urban development was not about transforming things, but about not unduly interfering with things so that they could reach their full potential? What if urban planning would enable us all to become spokespersons of other species so that they could have a say in how we plan and build our cities? Maybe then we would not unduly interfere with the Oslo Fjord and other ecosystems. And my daughter would get some more marine friends that could teach her about the wonderful world that exists in the sea. And she would grow up. Never for a moment think that she was born to rule that world, but that she was born to care for it. Thank you. <laughs>